Hello, everyone. Welcome to National Quilting Day. My name is Carolyn Ducey. I am curator of collections at the International Quilt Museum. And I'm very excited today to share a little bit of information about our newest exhibition, Abstract Design in American Quilts at 50. This is really a significant exhibition for us. We are looking back at an exhibition that was held in 1971 at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. It was curated by Jonathan Holstein and Gail Vanderhoof. And it had such long reaching implications. It, it affected so many things. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but it, it was really an impactful show and was one of the very, very first quilt exhibitions to put quilts on the wall and to, to view quilts as, as art rather than just their, their quilted medium. And it just um, impacted so many um, things that, that we know of as just typical of quilting today. So we're gonna talk more about that. Um, first, I'd love to give you a little bit of background about Jonathan Holstein and Gail Vanderhoof, who you see pictured here in the 1970s in their apartment in New York City. Um, Jonathan um, met Gail uh, about three years before this show. Um, they shared an interest in textiles. Gail was a wonderful textile artist, did a lot of handwork. Um, Jonathan had a, a background in art and was interested in collecting all kinds of different things. So when they came together, they really had a lot of common interests. And in their journeys from New York City to the Pennsylvania countryside, you now looking for interesting items to collect, they came across quilts. And they really, both of them were aware of quilts, had grown up with quilts, but really had not viewed quilts as similar in a way to modern art. And, and there's not a direct correlation there um, from what Jonathan tells us, but they were so immersed in the art world of New York City that when they began to look at American um, traditional quilts, particularly the pieced examples, they really saw a connection. They saw what was happening in the work of abstract expressionists in New York City. And it really inspired them because they were kind of amazed that 100 years before these artists were making their um, seminal works, we are seeing similar elements and some similar qualities in quilts. So they began collecting, um, going out every weekend in their Volkswagen van and, and picking up quilts and, and acquiring a pretty significant collection. And as they did, the idea for an exhibition started to grow in their heads. And so they um, talked to their friends, talked to people who were involved in the New York art scene, started putting together a, a group of quilts that they really felt expressed this, this vision that they had this idea of these quilts as such a, a, a significant form of art that was seen across genres that um, they began to really create this group. So in 1971, you know, it was really a particularly interesting time in our history. So I'm gonna go back a little bit and talk about that period in a, in a bigger sense and why this idea of a quilt exhibit at a major art museum could really even take hold. Um, the seventies were just such an interesting period of social awareness and activity. We had the civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam sentiments. We had this idea of, of kind of, um, reacting against all of the changes in our world and going back to, to a more um, natural kind of lifestyle in many um, areas. So the hippie movement, the back to natural um, living, natural products, getting away from mechanization, all that was kind of in, in people's heads. We had the bicentennial coming up in 1976 and that was really um, a huge impact on the interest in quilting and working with your hands, doing your own artwork, doing your own clothing, sewing, quilt making, all of these trends were really becoming more and more popular. Um, so there were all of these elements that were swirling around in New York. So the um, abstract design show at the Whitney was not the only quilt show in the 70s. In fact, there was a, quite a number of them. Um, 
a lot of folk art shows were coming out. Just a lot of artists that were exploring new ways of looking at art. And so it was really a, an exciting and dynamic period. And it just happened that um, Jonathan and Gail got to know the um, director at the Whitney. They presented their quilts to him in a slide program. And then as Jonathan said, he, he didn't think the slides would really make the seal the deal. So he brought images of quilts and showed them to the director. And he was pretty enthused about this, though it was interesting in talking to Jonathan that even though he showed a few quilts to the director, they never showed the curators at the Whitney what exactly they were bringing to hang for the exhibition that summer. So he said it was interesting that they were given that freedom to produce the show exactly the way they wanted it. And so the show went up in July of 1971. It was up until September. It was actually extended because it was so popular people reacted to it in a really interesting way, kind of a dichotomy of this um, really positive reaction. And then some people who reacted against it. So the press, the, the art world really responded to the quilts. Um, bringing them to people's awareness just created this buzz about the quilts and the fact that they, the designs of these pieces were so strong. So we have people like Hilton um, Kramer of the New York Times, who was one of their leading art critics, who had a glowing review of the show. So as these reviews came out, it really led to a lot of buzz about the show and it became more and more popular. And people just felt that it was such an interesting thought that these women who were making quilts were, were way ahead of these artists of a hundred years later. Um, there were questions like, did these artists possibly see quilts? Perhaps they saw them unconsciously. Perhaps they were on clotheslines or on their beds and reacting to those. And, and we don't know if that's the case. We're not aware of that. But it is really interesting that some of the elements that were so considered so modern in the abstract expressionists were, were seen in earlier quilts. There was, though, a, 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 another kind of reaction to this, um, because when um, Jonathan and Gail showed the quilts, they did not have makers' names. They did not have provenance for these pieces. They, it, it wasn't, it just simply was something that the dealers did not even take the time to acquire, because at this time, quilts really hadn't gained any real significance in our, um, in culture. They, we, people were aware of them but there was no need to even worry about who made them um, when dealers bought them and turned around and sold them. Quilts were being sold for very, very little money. So Jonathan and Gail did not have that information. But one of the things that feminists, particularly of the 1970s, and that was another huge movement of the time, what they felt that, the, that um, Jonathan and Gail had done was to kind of remove that idea of the quilt as women's work. And so they had taken them out of their context and they were showing them removed from the home, removed from women. And that really caused a great uh, controversy among feminist women who were saying, you know, you, you cannot take women out of this picture the way you did. So the 1971 exhibition was really impactful um, and it went on to, encourage people to look at quilts in a new way. It, it led to uh, collecting of quilts, it led to quilt research, it led to um, more quilts and exhibitions, and it ultimately led here to the International Quilt Museum. In fact, my colleague Jonathan Gregory, who wrote a wonderful essay for the catalog for this show, just the other day talked about how one of our, our premier quilters, Mary Gormley, who was a member of the Lincoln Quilters Guild, a founding member, actually traveled um, to Iowa to see the exhibition as it traveled the United States. And it was really impactful in, in encouraging her to become an instructor. Mary had learned to quilt from her mother-in-law. She was well-versed in quilting, but it really encouraged her and, and kind of spawn this whole movement. So Mary was one of the first people here in Lincoln that was teaching quilting. And as a member of the Lincoln Quilters Guild, Mary was a, a leader in bringing a quilt exhibit to our Sheldon Art Gallery here on the University of Nebraska campus, which was really exceptional. In 1977, it led to the first one of the first quilt symposiums where 
individuals were brought in to teach and to lecture about quilts. And those, uh, those things that, the, that our local guild were involved with in the 1970s ultimately led to the Nebraska Quilt Project, which then led to Robert and artist James, who were collecting and looking for a home for their quilts, and then in turn led to the development of the International Quilt Museum. So the abstract design show is just a part of this trajectory that led to where we are today in so many ways. And I think that um, we have a wonderful catalog that has just come out. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, and there's just some terrific essays that are gonna really help you see just the, the incredible impact of this show. But let's take a look at just a couple quilts. I know we always wanna look at quilts. Here's a couple images of the Whitney exhibition. The, um, the image on the right is um, our circles and crosses quilt, which was in the lobby of the Whitney. And then we see some of the other quilts that were hung in their exhibit spaces. And here is one of the quilts that um, was actually featured on a book that Jonathan Holstein wrote about 20 years later, he did a biography, as he called it, of the exhibition called Abstract Design in American Quilts. And he, he laid out the whole story of how he found quilts, developed the exhibition, and then the far reaching um, places that the quilts went to in the exhibition, including internationally. And my colleague, Maren Hansen, has a wonderful essay on the impact that the Abstract Design Show had in Japan and what a, a factor it was in the incredible um, popularity of quilting and quilt making in Japan today still. So he, this is a, just a, one of my favorites in the exhibition on um, this nine patch quilt. I love it because it is really, when you break it down, it's really very simple. It's a nine patch block. It's done in wool, late 1900s. Um, in fact, most of the quilts I'm gonna show you today are coming from about the 1880s to 1900 or 1910, um, which was kind of the heyday of, of quilting in America. But take a closer look at this quilt and you can see that most of the nine patch blocks have a red square in the center. It's only in the, in the center of the actual quilt that you see one block where the red blocks create the, the nine patch around the gray center. What inspired that quilt maker to make that simple change that gave it such a dramatic look? You never know. Um, was it an error? It could be. I know in, in when I make quilts, sometimes those things happen serendipitously. But it also could have been a very conscious decision to just change that up and, and, and that creates such an area where your eye is drawn to. I also love that at the bottom of the quilt, you see the scale really change and the size of the blocks is so much smaller. And again, that could have been a practical reason. Maybe fabric was getting low and she wanted to finish it. Maybe she started out with smaller blocks and decided it's just gonna take her too long to make that quilt. So she made the blocks larger. Those are the stories we wish we knew from our quilt makers, but we don't have that information. But in the meantime, you have these blocks of color. You can see how this would relate to that abstract expressionist art that, that um, Jonathan and Gail Vanderhoof were seeing. Um, it's just such a stunningly simple and beautiful quilt. This log cabin, I have to say, um, I always say I have favorites, but this is one of my favorites in the show because I'm always drawn to the log cabin block because it's a very simple block. It's a simple constructed block. So you begin with your center square and you basically add logs or strips of fabric around that center square. And the placement of your fabric is what is most important. So if you look closely at an individual block in this quilt, and it's not always easy to see that, um, you start with the black center, and then you have your lights and your darks. Light and dark fabrics split, so half of the block is dark and half is light. And it's just by positioning those blocks, by, if you look closely, by putting all the dark halves together in a set of four, that you get this incredible pattern. And to me, the quilt looks like it has this overlaid shadowing across it, but it's really created by just how those blocks are put together and then placed so carefully. And it makes such an incredibly dynamic pattern. And 
that's what I love about log cabin quilts because you start with a simple block, but depending how you place it within your overall pattern, you can create four or five different um, what we call settings. So you can create a barn raising or streak of lightning or courthouse steps, all of these different patterns that can come out of a very simple block. And what I love about this quilt, the two things that, that really are apparent to me is the, the black um, center square that is consistent throughout and then the red outline square next to it. And those two pieces of the quilt stay consistent throughout it. Then you have a lot of other print fabrics that are used um, just as the quilt maker chose. Um, but it is those two unifying factors in this quilt that I think make it so striking and really make it so successful. And it is just stunningly beautiful. I, I could look at it all day. The split bars piece here is really exceptional. Again, what a simple uh, construction, a simple overall pattern, just using these long bars of color. But when you add in those, those skinny bars of orange to the brown and the neutral shade here, it just gives this quilt such life. And again, the, this, the idea of the color field that you would see, for example, in Barnett Newman, one of the extract expressionists, you can see how Jonathan Holstein and Gail Vanderhoof would have really seen a relationship between these different art forms. Then we have the circles and crosses, which we saw in the earlier slide in the lobby of the um, Whitney Museum of Art in New York City. Again, what a dynamic pattern. Now, this quilt has, um, has, has seen some um, changes, some effects of light exposure and just a fugitive dye. So this quilt originally would have probably been a bright green instead of the tan colors. Um, so when we call it a fugitive dye, the late 1900s, we see a green dye that was used pretty consistently for quilt making and clothing. It was a brilliant, brilliant green, but very, very quickly, just by oxidizing or being exposed to oxygen, that green would change and it would fade very quickly from that brilliant green to a nondescript tan like this. So the quilt would have been phenomenal as a bright green, but I think it still just has an incredible um, design element. The repetition of that form, that kind of maroon block in the very center. And then the more elaborate sashing, the way she added multiple borders between the, the blocks, I think gives it a, a just a really complex and beautiful design. And, and that repetition of form is very much like what we see in Andy Warhol paintings where he's using the same form over and over again. So this one also really has a, a great appeal and um, a great, relationship to those abstract expressionists. This is a piece that actually created a lot of the fervor over the, the women, the feminist artists who, or feminist writers who were reacting to Jonathan Holstein's, um, the way he showed the quilts and the fact that he did not recognize makers because it does have a name um, stenciled on it. So if you look in the lower left, you'll see ES Wrights. That is a name that we've researched. We do research on any name that we have that's related to a quilt, um, whether it's family information or it's actually inscribed or printed on the quilt as it is here. But that name was fairly um, ubiquitous in um, Pennsylvania. So we were not able to specifically find that individual. And unfortunately that often happens with our research. We can place the quilt in the right place, the right time but that we can't necessarily learn a lot about the individual maker. But this is one quilt of all of these that actually had an inscription on it and had a name. And people really wanted that to be acknowledged and they wanted the, the makers, especially the fact that they were women to be acknowledged. And that was something that Jonathan just, it wasn't his focus for this show. And so he, and, and like I said earlier, he just didn't have that information about these quilts, so he wasn't able to share that. Again, this, this rainbow stripes is just a, a really amazing design. The simplicity of it, the repetition of those colors placed all in a row, 
it, it just creates a really striking piece. And the other thing that I uh, that I love about this quilt is if you look at the binding, for example, the, the maker did not use the same fabric. She used what she had most likely. She changed that binding color and it gives it just another element of excitement. It gives another element of surprise to it. Um, it's simply quilted. And again, this one's seen a little wear and tear. Uh, the quilts that um, were shown in abstract design had an incredible life. They went on to be shown in so many different exhibitions in so many different locations that they show a little bit of that wear, but that is something that as a museum, we are accustomed to see a few of those dings on a quilt, what we call the patina of age. And the fact that the quilts were seen so widely and we have such great history is what really makes them incredibly valuable for us. So we have produced an amazing exhibition catalog that um, really delves into the history of the um, abstract design show. Um, Jonathan Holstein um, wrote a wonderful essay kind of looking back at what he experienced 50 years ago and the subsequent changes and um, impact that the show had. Um, I wrote an essay looking at how the um, abstract design show really impacted artists who are making what we call studio quilts today, which are quilts that are not meant to be functional. They are meant to be on a museum wall. And artists today are taking that phenomenon and that, that idea of quilts as art into incredible realms, really expanding the definition of art quilts. Um, New York Nexus, um, Raising the Profile and Journey to Japan. My colleague, Martin Hansen, has done a wonderful discussion for you today that really discussed those shows and the um, different focuses they each have. Those three are actually going to be an additional exhibitions that you can see here at the International Quilt Museum. So you can see, um, you can get that catalog at our museum shop online, but you can also come and visit and see the quilts that reflect the, the research and the, the wonderful writing that was done by all of our curators. So in addition to Marn Hansen and Jonathan Gregory, we have um, Sandra Sider, who's curator at the Texas Quilt Museum, um, an amazing um, writer and artist of her, her own right, um, who has done another wonderful essay for the catalog. So I really encourage you come see the show. It's so exciting that the quilts themselves are still together, that we can care for them and house them here at the International Quilt Museum. And to look back at history like this and to see the impact of this show is, is really amazing. So encourage you come visit and enjoy the show and um, enjoy Marin's lecture that will be following mine today for National Quilting Day. Um, we've got a lot of great things for you today. So enjoy and thanks so much for being here.